So the first recipe I want to teach you how to make is braised chicken. And I don't want you to think about this as if it's uh, something real fancy. What I'm going to teach you how to do is make this chicken so that if you want during the week, you will have shredded chicken that you can use in a salad or in a quesadilla or in all kinds of other uses in your kitchen where you need shredded cooked chicken. And then you'll also have as a byproduct of this dish that I show you, you'll also have a little bit of chicken broth that you made from scratch that you can then use in other stuff. Very often, um, food that you're cooking in the kitchen, especially from scratch, requires a flavorful liquid. And most of the time they ask you to use chicken broth or a broth of some kind. And so having some of that on hand, especially stuff that you made yourself, makes your cooking that much better. And so I'm gonna show you how to basically create two staples in your kitchen with one dish. And so that's what we're gonna do today. And I wanted to start by showing you how I get ready. We're gonna show you my mise en place. And so you can start to emulate this as you work your way through. So the first thing I do is I get my ingredients ready. Now I did do that ahead of time because I am kind of wired in here. I don't know if you can see, but I have a wire uh, microphone on. And so I'm kind of wired in here. So walking around my kitchen's a little tough. And so I did pull some stuff toward me. But what I got ready was the ingredients that I need for this particular recipe, which are all in front of me here. And then I also got a few things ready. So I have my pot ready. I have a couple of utensils just off of camera here. And so that's what I'm gonna be showing you how to get ready. So the first thing I do is I get my workstation ready. And so what I wanna do is I wanna lay a cutting board down. Now, here's my cutting board back here. And cutting boards, I'm gonna set this down so you can see, cutting boards will shift. And so on a countertop, the countertops are smooth. And so the cutting board is smooth. And this, with very little pressure, moves around a lot. And so you wanna make sure that this doesn't happen to you while you're, while you're cutting. And as you're cutting, you can see it's starting to move. All I'm doing is barely touching it and it's starting to move. It's like, it's like playing air hockey up here. And you don't wanna do that. You wanna make sure that things are secure. And the best way to do that is a real simple, simple hack here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna, we're gonna take and we're gonna wet this piece of paper towel. I'm gonna wring it out. And I'm gonna take this piece of paper towel and I'm gonna lay it flat on my counter. So I'm gonna lay this piece of paper towel nice and flat on my counter. And as you can see, it's nice and flat. And when I put my cutting board on top of it, my cutting board doesn't move anymore. It's now secure to the countertop. That water is sort of suctioning it on. That, that piece that's underneath there, that piece of, of uh, paper towel isn't allowing me to move it. And so it's nice and secure now. And so now my workstation is set. Now what I need is a garbage bowl. This is another thing I'm gonna tell you you should always have at your station. Whenever you're cooking at home, you wanna make sure you have a nice big deep bowl that you can then throw your scraps into. It's much better than if I'm, if I'm peeling something, turning around into the garbage can, peeling it and setting it back. If I wanna cut or move anything off of my cutting board, picking this up constantly to, uh, to dump it into the garbage, that's not useful. This is perfect where it's, where it's sitting. It should stay here. And so I should actually have a little tiny refuse bowl nearby. And so I would suggest you get one of those. So now to get started, we gotta prep all of our food. We're gonna get our, our actual mise en place, our food prep ready so that when we start cooking, I don't have to worry about cutting things. I can just focus on the actual cooking part. As you get better and as you get more comfortable in the kitchen, you may split this up. You may start something on the stove while you cut something, that's okay. But as you get started, as you first start out, try to make sure you get all your prep done ahead of time. It calls for a tablespoon of something, measure out that tablespoon of something ahead of time and put it in a small bowl and set it on the side. If it calls for a whole onion diced, dice that onion, put it in a small bowl, get rid of the refuse and make sure it's ready to go. So the moment it calls for it in the recipe as you're reading it, you can just dump it directly in and, and keep cooking. You don't have to stop to do things as you work your way through the recipe. So this recipe is super simple. And in fact, you can exchange a lot of things in here for other things. That's why these, uh, this is more of a method than it is an actual recipe. Uh, I'm gonna be using specifically a flavoring ingredient that is used many times in French cuisine called mirepoix. Now mirepoix is two parts onion to one part celery and one part carrot. It's a trinity and there's many different trinities that you can find in cooking all over the world. It will always be a set of aromatics 
that they use very frequently in their food. Now, in Europe, some real common types of vegetables are celery, carrots, and onions. And so they found a way to set these up in a ratio so it flavors their food in a particular way. This is a really common thing. You're gonna be, you're, in fact, in your kitchen, a lot of times, if you're cooking a lot of different types of cuisines, specifically French cuisine, and French influenced a lot of European cuisine, you're gonna wanna have these on hand as a staple in your kitchen all the time. Carrots, celery, and onion. This recipe is an absolute perfect opportunity for you to practice your knife skills. When you're cooking in, a, in an industrial kitchen, Someone will set a 50 pound bag of onions on your station and say, please dice these. And so then you'll have to dice all the onions or you'll use a machine to do it. But, but genuinely, they're gonna want you to, to cook for hours and hours and hours and, be pre and prep for hours and hours and hours and you'll get very good eventually cutting in onions. But as a home cook, you rarely have an opportunity to actually do a lot of real heavy uh, prep. So. Whenever you get the opportunity, you should try to practice the skills that you're gonna build. You're never gonna get really, really good with a knife unless you practice with it. You should always try to make sure that your practice with the knife mirrors exactly how you would use that knife. You should never grab something and say, well, I just need to quickly cut this, and then as I cut it, my fingers are sticking out and I'm slapping it down and I'm not really paying attention to where the blade is just because I needed to do it quickly. The, the more comfortable you get with the way the knife works, the easier it's gonna be for you to be safe and be fast with it. But you've gotta practice these motions over and over and over again in order for it to work. So this is a perfect opportunity for you to practice those motions. So I'm gonna show you some real simple basic knife skills today on three different types of vegetables. So we're gonna start with the onion. Now, as I get started, I wanna make sure that I have my steel and my knife. You're gonna to wanna to learn how to do this. There's plenty of videos out there to show you how to do this a little better with a, probably a better camera setup than I have. But remember, I'm holding this at a 45 degree angle. I'm holding the knife at a 20 degree angle to my, uh, to my steel. I am pulling the steel, I am pulling knife toward my steel, toward this protective piece that's covering my hand. I'm pulling it down and I'm doing it exactly the same on the other side, and I'm doing it multiple times in order to straighten my knife blade. And so I'm gonna show you how to do that again do this nice and slow, and as time goes on, you're gonna get better and better with it. So I did two things there. One, I didn't do it over my station. Little tiny metal filings fall off when you do this. So you don't wanna do this over your station. You don't wanna do this over your cutting board. You also wanna rinse your knife when you're finished with it. Because there are tiny little metal filings on there that you don't want in your food. So, uh, so you wanna rinse your knife as soon as you're finished. So now that I know I have a nice sharp knife, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut this onion. So in order to dice this onion, now normally I can cut this into pretty much any shape I want because this is gonna cook in this liquid for a long time. So it doesn't have to be in any particular shape. So I can basically make it whatever I want. If I wanted to say quarter this onion and just throw it in there because I was in a hurry, I could do that. But I'm gonna show you how to dice an onion and as you start working on this, you might wanna practice that. And dicing an onion is perfectly fine for this. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut it in half. Now when you cut an onion in half, there's a root end and there's a sprout end. You wanna cut it exactly so that you're cutting through both of those at the same time. So as you can see, I'm going to fold my fingers in. They are gonna to be touching that side of the blade. And so now when, I, when the blade touches the side of my, my, my fingers there, I know where the blade is. I'm using two different senses right now to know exactly where that blade is. I'm using my sight and I'm using my feel. And so when I can, if I have two different senses that are, that are pinpointing where that blade is, I have a much better chance of knowing exactly where that blade is than just by looking at it. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna slide it alongside and I'm gonna use, I'm gonna be holding onto this nice and firm. And as you can see, I, I, my fingers are, are basically pressed down into it and they're, they're turned in. They are not held out like this. I am not holding out my fingers trying to, trying to cut like this. This is very dangerous to do. You wanna make sure that you tuck your fingers in whenever you can. Like I say, even if you're trying to do something quickly, you wanna to try to tuck your fingers in, okay? So now I have the two different places. I can feel it and I can see it. I'm gonna cut straight to the center of it, okay? Now once that's done, I've gotta cut the two pieces off the end, right? I've gotta cut the sprout ends off. So I'm gonna do that real quick. Again, I'm touching it to the back of my, back of my finger and I'm sliding the knife through. 
Now I have my garbage bowl here. I'm just going to throw the top right in there. And I'm going to do the same thing for this side. Okay. So there we go. We have these two pieces. Now I've got to get this thin onion paper off. But what I don't want to do is I don't want to keep, I don't want to pull so much of the onion out with it so that the onion itself is, come, is basically being wasted and I'm throwing it away. I don't want to do that. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to fold this back. Now, you can, if you want, rip this completely off. But I find as a new cook and as somebody who's just starting to learn knife skills, this little flap back here is actually really useful for you. So as you start working your hand backwards, you're going to be working your hand backwards on the knife. And then this will give you something to hold on to as you get near the end of the onion. And I'm going to show you that now. So what we're going to do is we're going to cut. Now there's, there's another cut you need to do when you dice an onion. You can see that the onion itself has these little rings in it, right? And so what we want to do is we want to cut alongside three times or four times, depending on the thickness of the onion, we want to cut some, some horizontal layers in here. Then we're going to cut some perpendicular layers in here. And then we're going to cut across like this as a cube, OK? So we're going to start with the horizontal layers. I find the horizontal layers are easier to do. Some people do it the other way. They will cut the vertical layers first, and then they'll cut the horizontals. I find that harder to do because it feels like I have to hold the onion in on the side when I do that. I don't like to do that. I like to hold my hand flat. And now this is going to be actually very hard to see in the camera. But, um, but I hold my hand flat, and then I, I basically pull myself back a little bit away from the, the cutting board edge so my, my, my hand can come in and slice. I'm going to try to do this just by home. I don't do this at home. If you're going to do this, I just want to show you what it looks like. So I'm actually doing it this way. But when you do it, hold your palm on top of the onion that, and keep your fingers up. That way that you can't hurt yourself. I'm going to do it this way just one time so you can see what it looks like. So I'm holding it or parallel to the cutting board, and I'm slicing straight through like so. So I'm going to do the other two here right away. I would do one above it and then another one above it. And now the, the onion is cut three different times. You can see the onion is cut three different ways. Now I'm going to cut straight down on this onion. I'm going to use my fingers again to cut like so. And as you can see, I never was in danger, not a moment there. And now my onion is ready to be diced, OK? So what we're going to do is we're going to dice this onion. It's been, it's been perpendicular. It's been horizontal cut. And now it's one more time. So I wanted to say something that I didn't get a chance to say while I was cutting this. The reason why we're keeping the root end on this onion is so that the onion stays together while we cut it. If we cut the root end off of the onion, it's going to fall apart. So that's why I'm going to great pains to make sure that this root end stays on the onion. And as you can see, I'm holding on to this little root end at the end. See how I'm holding on to that? And this little piece of, of skin here, this onion skin, is actually helping me do it. Now when I get to the very end, I like flipping it over a little bit and cutting a few pieces off here so I'm not throwing out so much of it. And then really, this little piece at the end is mostly the root. I'll throw that away. And here we have our wonderful diced onion. OK, now it's not all perfectly diced. As you can see, there's little pieces here that still need to be cut up. But for the most part, that was a pretty good dice. And if you needed something for like a salsa or something, this is about the right size for that. Um, when you want to move something off your cutting board onto a bowl, you're going to want to use your knife. Now, what you don't want to do is you don't want to take your knife and drag it across using the front edge of your knife. If you're going to move anything around, you turn your knife over and you move it sideways. Now you can, if you want, slide underneath the food, just be careful, and then, and then use it as like a little shovel to move your food, your cut food, directly into your bowl. But you don't want to, you don't want to drag it perpendicular, it's OK if it's at a little bit of an angle. You're not going to dull your knife too much that way. One really important thing that people forget is that they hold their knives in really strange ways. They'll hold their knife back here, or they'll hold their knife like so. And this is not a great way to hold your knife. You want to make sure you choke up on the knife. The farther up on the knife you are, the more 
uh, the more control you have of that blade. And when I, and actually this little piece here is made for your thumb. And so I actually hold my, my knife here with my thumb and this, this piece here is made for my other finger. And so I actually hold my knife like so. It's actually holding it on top of the blade and you're gonna wanna practice that right away. You're gonna wanna get comfortable with where your knife is in your hand. And I'll be perfectly frank, this is the best place for you to hold the knife because you have a lot of control here. Get more comfortable with it being here in your hand rather than you holding onto it like so. So now there's a concept, another concept I wanna introduce you to, it's called clean as you go. I am not as perfect at this as I'd like to be, but it is something that you should try to strive for all the time. Uh, clean as you go makes it so that once you're done, it's a lot easier to finish up cleaning up after you're finished, and it keeps your workstation clean, and it's a lot less, uh, it's a lot less likely that you're actually gonna hurt yourself. If the, my cutting board was full of a bunch of stuff and there was a bunch of, uh, a bunch of different types of wrappers or different stuff on here, it might be that the cutting board uh, is, is too cluttered for me to work. And so you wanna make sure that your space is nice and clean. So now uh, we should wash vegetables before we get started. Uh, vegetables, have, vegetables have dirt on them that we need to make sure that we wash off. Um, some people use a, uh, some people will use a, a brush uh, I feel like these, these vegetables themselves are relatively clean. I'm not going to be brushing them out, but you can certainly buy a, food, uh, a, a, a fruit and vegetable brush. So now in order to, uh, to use these carrots, they have to be peeled. So in order to peel these carrots, what I want you to do, you got a peeler, right? You'll find yourself a peeler. I like the peelers. I like these stick peelers more than I like the ones that look like a Y. I feel like the Y ones don't do a great job, and I also feel real awkward with them. I hold the peeler in one hand and I pull towards me. Most peelers are made specifically to pull towards you, especially the stick peelers like this. They're made to pull towards you. So as I, I hold it right over this, this garbage bowl here and then I just slide it. And as I slide it, and so as I pull it, you can see it's just dropping the refuse directly into the bowl. And my carrot is perfectly peeled. You'll get better with this as time goes on, but the peeler really does work really well when it is pulled towards you rather than, I've seen people do it where they go like this and that's not useful. It's, 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 you're flailing away at the carrot. There's no way, to, no reason to do that. Um, you wanna just try to pull it towards you. Get off all the gunk and you're perfect. So now carrots have Again, sprout and root end. We're gonna cut off a piece of this end. We're gonna cut off a piece of this end. Now, a carrot, like many other things in your, it, when you cut, it rolls, right? And so it rolling is not great for you. Something that rolls means that there's a possibility it can roll and cut you. So what I try to do is I try to cut the carrot in half first. Um, you're never gonna be able to cut these perfectly uh, into squares because again, you're cutting a cylinder into squares and so it's, it's very difficult. So if I'm cutting something and I'm trying to cut squares into it, what I'll try to do first is try to square it off as best I can. Um, an easy way to do that is to actually cut it into halves first. So I'm gonna do that first. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna turn a little bit so you can see what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna press down and I'm gonna stick my knife point in here. And there we go. So I'm gonna cut, again, once it's flat, I'll cut it into quarters. And so this way, I cut it into quarters, but not all the way down because I wanna to try to keep these in uniform size. So I'm cutting it part way rather than cutting it all the way. So now I'm gonna use my technique that I used earlier and cut these into sort of a quarter moon size. I'm, the, the knife itself is not sliding past my hand. I can feel where it's at. I actually don't even have to look at it. I can look directly at the camera because I'm using my touch, my sense of touch as well as my sense of sight when I'm cutting. So now we've got to do the same thing with our celery. I have two pieces of celery here. I want to cut this little piece of root end off the end. And then the celery tips are normally cut off at the grocer and they're a little gross. I don't know if you can see that, it's a little disgusting. So I wanna get rid of that piece where it could possibly have some bacteria in the end. We'll get rid of that. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna cut these into 
uh, I'm basically going to cut these in half. And the best way to do that is to find sort of the middle of one, like so. And then I am going to basically slide my knife all the way down the center of it to cut it into, half, into a half. And so I'm going to do the same thing here. Slide my knife all the way down the center. And then I'm going to cut these into pieces, smaller pieces. And I'm doing a rocking motion with this. As you can see, I'm sliding the knife through. And then it lifts up. And it comes back to slide back. As you work your way through cutting more and more and more and get more and more comfortable with it, you will be able to master this particular motion. And I'm not a per, I'm, trust me, I have a lot to learn when it comes to knife skills. I'm okay, but there's plenty of chefs out there that are really solid, absolutely dynamite with knife skills because they've cut hours and hours and hours and hours more than I ever have. But the only way to get good is through practice. So keep practicing and, and keep trying and always do it the correct way and it will help you get faster with the correct way. So now what else goes into this recipe is uh, these herbs. Now I'm not actually gonna cut these herbs up. Uh, in fact, uh, the herbs, I have a few parsley stems in the bottom. I have a couple of pieces of thyme in here that I put in here earlier. And I also have a couple of pieces of uh, rosemary. And so you can use whatever kind of fresh or dried herbs that you have. Real common herbs that would go in something like this would be rosemary and thyme. Uh, you would want to use parsley as well. Those are the real sort of very common flavoring items that you would put in there. But you can flavor it with whatever you like and whatever kind of herbs that, are particular, that you particularly like. You can use bay leaf in here if you want. Um, there's all different kinds of different herbs, but fresh herbs actually really do add a wonderful flavor to this. So I would urge you to get fresh herbs over dry. I'm not going to cut these, and in fact, I'm going to dump these directly into the water when we get this thing going. Um, and then I'll, uh, since again, we're really only fishing out the chicken, I'm just going to take the chicken out, and then these will be discarded with the, with the vegetables when we're finished. I am going to add a little bit of garlic, and so uh, the thing about garlic is, is that I don't need it to be to be completely diced up, but I am going to dice it up to show you how to do it today. Okay, so it doesn't have to be. I could really just crush it really quickly and just leave it and just throw it in there because again, it's just going to be discarded. But um, but I wanted to show you how to do it, and so one thing you want to do in order to get the garlic out of its skin, um, an easy way is to nip off the end. There's a root end on here, and I'm going to nip that off. So once that's nipped off, this piece is wide open. Now I'm going to take my knife, and you can do it two different ways. I've seen it a couple different ways. One way is to smack it like this. Your other hand's away from it. This hand's away from it. You should be OK to give it a good whack with the side of your blade. I actually like to make sure it's a little safer than that. I lay the blade flat onto my cutting board. And as I lay it flat onto my cutting board, I give it a good whack. See, there was no way I could cut myself because I hit right here. And you could see my hand was, was tilted upward, and I was using the, the heel of my palm to give it a good swat. Once I did that, the paper just comes directly off. Okay, And so now I have this garlic that has been smashed. And this is where you're going you're gonna to use your rocking motion. So a rocking motion with the knife is where I have my hand on the front of the knife and my hand on the back of the knife, and I use the blade shape to rock back and forth. And so that will cut. And as it cuts, it moves back and forth and it cuts things very finely. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to rock it back and forth on this. And if you feel like your, your garlic is starting to get away from you, you can always slide your knife like so to try to pull it back into where it needs to be in one small area. It's helpful if it's all in one area. As you can see, I'm not in any danger at all of hurting myself here, OK? So I am rocking back and forth. And there's my fingers are not down here. My fingers are not in front of it. They're on top. And so I'm not in any danger of hurting myself. And that's really key. That's the proper way to do it. 
And as you can see, this garlic is nice, finely minced, and I can keep going with it if I wanted to. And in fact, there's a, another technique that you learn later on that you can actually add salt to this and grind it with your blade. I'm sure I'll do a recipe eventually to show you how to do that too. But you can keep going even finer to make this into a paste. But, uh, but it's, it's a nice fine garlic chop. And this would be fine for any minced garlic that you would need. Um, you could use, you could essentially cut it into that size. Again, for this recipe, it's not very necessary. I just wanted to show you how to do it. You could really just crush that garlic co clove and just throw it into the, to the final dish. All right, so we're almost finished. Let me, let me clean off my cutting board just a touch. So now we have our chicken. You're gonna to wanna to go out and get bone in, skin on chicken thighs. And that's what we have here. Now, I'm using the same cutting board that I use for my, uh, for my vegetables. I'm also touching chicken now. So when we talked about sanitation earlier in this playlist, you know how to do this correctly. Now everything here is gonna be cooked for a very long time. So if I were to touch my chicken and then touch my vegetables, it's not a big deal because this is all gonna get cooked for a really, really long time. But if that was a salad and I touch my chicken, I don't wanna to touch my vegetables. So just make sure you're paying attention to the protocols you put forth in your kitchen to try to remain safe. Meat cutting board for stuff that gets cooked for a really long time. I don't wanna now cut a salad on this. All right. So the first thing we wanna do is get rid of the skin on these. We gotta pull the skin off. And we're gonna try our best to pull the skin off, but we might not be able to pull it completely off. Now, right now it's sort of attached. I'm actually gonna use my knife to slice alongside here just a little bit to try to get it so it's free. And then once it's free, I'm gonna pull it. And I'm actually gonna cut a little bit down here to cut some of this fat off too. So I pulled the skin directly off. I don't need the skin in these, okay? This is gonna cook for a really long time, and in fact, the skin's beautiful, wonderful little crunchy thing that I can turn into a uh, delicious cracklin, which I'm gonna show you how to do in a second. And I have a bunch of other skin that I, uh, that I did earlier in the week. I made this earlier in the week, so, um, so I'm actually gonna show you how to make the cracklins too. I did it in another video, but I'm gonna show you specifically how to do it. Um, but we're gonna cut a little bit here, cutting away this skin away from, the, from the, the chicken thigh itself, and we're gonna set these chicken thighs back in their bowl. We wanna get all the skin off of these because the skin is, the skin, while the skin is wonderful, if you're just gonna saute these and then serve them, the skin is beautiful, it's a wonderful thing to have. But it's, it's in this particular recipe, it's gonna cook for over an hour inside of there, and the skin's just gonna get gross and sort of floppy, and you're eventually just gonna discard it anyway. Now, don't get me wrong, the skin will add a little bit of flavor to the broth, but there's bones in here and lots of meat, and so we're not worried so much about that. Remember to make sure that, you know, you only really, really need to use your knife when you absolutely have to on here, you don't have to use your knife all the time to cut these off. The, the skin mostly comes directly off, and you only have to use your knife uh, when it's really, really on there, when it's really, really connected. All right, so now we have our chicken thighs. Our chicken thighs and all of our ingredients, and we're gonna get started cooking this braise. So the first thing you wanna do is get your pan hot. You don't wanna add uh, you don't want to add food to a cold pan. Uh, it's going to stick. The oil, you put your oil inside of a hot pan, that's going to help it so that the food will not stick to it. Um, and so that's what we're going to do. We're going to wait until this comes up to temperature. Uh, the, a good way to do that is to hold your hand inside of the pan, not touching anything. You can definitely feel whether or not your pan is hot. I know my pan is hot right now. What I want to do first is I want to uh, cook the chicken till it's brown, and then I'm gonna take it out and add my vegetables, and then, and then I'm gonna basically uh, saute them, uh, what we call sweating them, and it's gonna make it so that the, the onion will turn translucent, they'll change a little bit of color, and they're gonna to start to get really fragrant. That takes about five minutes, and so that's what we're gonna do. But I wanna actually cook these first. Now, I'm gonna add a little bit of salt and pepper to these uh, to start out. Adding salt to your meat when you cook it is kind of important because it actually draws the moisture out of your meat. Uh, when you cook uh, with a 
when you cook uh, and, and things are, don't have salt on them, they can sometimes, you know, they, they don't turn as brown. And so that's what we want to do is we want to make sure that this is nice and brown. I have my pepper here. I'm going to sprinkle a little bit of pepper on there too uh, to give it a little bit of flavor. We're going to turn it over and do the same thing. This meat is going to be ready to drop directly in. When you're sauteing things, make sure you don't crowd your pan. Don't put the, don't put, don't fill this thing up all the way up to the top with meat. Uh, you want to make sure that you can still see the bottom of the pan a little bit when you add uh, your meat inside of it. Uh, the, the more space that's in between each one of these things, the more chance it has to brown. If you start stacking it on top of each other, essentially what you're doing is letting the, the water come out. You're releasing the water. It's turning into steam, and you're eventually just going to gray your meat rather than brown it. And so you want to make sure that there's space in between for that steam to escape. And once that steam escapes, then you're not actually steaming it. You're frying it. So you hear that? That's the sound of hot oil. So now I shouldn't be going around my kitchen touching a bunch of stuff. I'm going to wash my hands because I just touched chicken. Now this chicken doesn't have to cook all the way through. This chicken only has to cook so it's brown. So that's what we're doing right now. You want to be at about a medium to a medium high heat here. So my, my stove goes up to 10. I want to be at a 7 or an 8. Okay. If you're cooking on a gas burner, you want the gas, uh, the, the flame, to be touching the, stove, the, the pan underneath. Um, not, not so hot that it's pouring out the sides, like with the double burner you need for... Uh, for pasta or something like that, but you want it to at least be touching the bottom of that pan. So now I use the nice neutral oil. I almost always use either peanut, canola, I use sometimes I use avocado oil. I mostly go with what's on sale. All those oils are essentially, they're very similar. Um, some are different in cholesterol counts and stuff like that. So if you're worried about your cholesterol, definitely pay attention to that more than I would. Um, but I look for oils with a nice high smoke point. Peanut oil is one of those oils that has just a really nice high smoke point. And so it's not going it, to, it can get a lot hotter before it produces that smoke that fills your kitchen. Olive oil, on the other hand, does not have a high smoke point, especially extra virgin olive oil. Extra virgin olive oil has a bunch of particulate matter in it, and you don't want uh, to be cooking uh, on high heat a lot of uh, extra virgin olive oil. Now, multiple pressed olive oil is okay, but it's still not great. Um, extra virgin olive oil really should be used as a finishing oil. It's one of those oils that you use when you're finishing your cooking. It doesn't get super hot. That's what you want to use it for. So as you can see, these are tiny, they're starting to turn brown. That's kind of right where I want to be. They don't need to get super brown. They can if you want. Um, like I said, it doesn't, it doesn't need to cook all the way through here. So this, this is, I'm just getting this brown, um, and then it eventually will be cooking uh, a long time in liquid. And so it doesn't have to get super brown. It's really just so that the final color of this the final dish looks good. All right, so I'm taking these out now. As you can see, that's brown. That's about as brown as you're going to get. These are not going to turn super brown. They're not going to turn super dark golden brown. Right now, we got a little bit of brown bits in here. That's what you want. You want to make sure you have some nice brown bits in there. That's called fond. We're actually going to, when we're done, we're going to deglaze this pan with some water. That's actually going to bring pop all that stuff off of there, and it's going to flavor the, the broth that we put in here. So I'm going to add my vegetables to this. I don't actually have to add a lot of oil because the oil from the chicken is in there as well as the oil that I added earlier. I am going to salt it, though. I'm going to salt it just a bit again to bring some of that moisture out of these vegetables because I want to make sure I draw that moisture out and I concentrate the flavor of these vegetables. We're doing a process here called sweating. And what I'm doing is I'm basically cooking these vegetables until they turn slightly translucent and get very fragrant.
as you can see, I'm using the pot I told you about. I'm using the, I'm using the, the heat proof spatula I told you about. I'm using the tongs I told you about. All these are real important tools to have in the kitchen. And these are nearly there. So the beauty of this recipe is, is that we don't need a lot of uh, other extra ingredients. You can, if you want to add chicken broth to this to really add a wonderful, like a really deep flavor to this. You could add some chicken broth. You could throw in some better than bouillon in here. It'll add a nice deep richness to this. But you can also just use water. This is gonna cook long enough with the bone and with the, with the chicken meat that it's gonna impart a lot of flavor just to water. And that's what we're gonna use today. So you can see there's some bits on the bottom here. What I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add my water directly to my pan. And I'm gonna use my spatula to scrape those bits up that are on the bottom. Now the amount of water you're gonna use, you're gonna, you're gonna actually use your, use your eyes just to know how much water you should add. So now I, don't wanna, I didn't wanna burn my garlic earlier. I added a little bit of water to this before I add my garlic. I'm gonna add my garlic in. I don't wanna burn it and I don't wanna throw it into the, and, and saute it. I just want it to, I want it to flavor things. What I don't want it to do is to cook too much. And garlic's very delicate. So you don't wanna, you don't wanna cook your garlic too much. I'm also gonna add all my herbs now. So my herbs, uh, I'm actually, like I said earlier, I'm gonna keep them on the stem. You can de-stem these, dice these up real fine if you want, but I, you don't need to do that. I'm gonna spread these out nice and, and uh, uh, throughout the entire pot. I'm adding thyme, I'm adding rosemary, and I'm adding parsley to this. I'm gonna give it a quick stir. Now I wanna lay my chicken thighs directly inside of this. I'm gonna nestle them inside of all this vegetable matter. And then what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add water to the side of this until it, it's starting to cover these thighs. Now I don't want them swimming in here, but I do want a little more than I would normally add. This is a little more, uh, a little more water than I would normally add. And the reason why I'm adding just a touch more water is because I wanna have a, a little bit of broth left over when I'm done that I could save for the week. And I'm actually gonna be shredding this chicken. But as you can see, these are not covered completely. They're not completely submerged. This small one is falling deep. But this big one here, if you look here, this big one is, is still uh, kind of almost perfectly where it needs to be. Now the other ones are smaller than it, so it, they're a little uh, where I, I, would, I would probably go to where this is, where it's about halfway up the side of the chicken. That's where you would normally put uh, the water level in here. And so that's what you wanna do. You wanna have your water about halfway up the side of your chicken. I added a little more because I wanna have a little more broth at the end of the week. So now I'm gonna wait till this comes to a boil. It's starting to come to a boil now. I'm gonna wait till it comes to a boil. Once it comes to a boil, I'm gonna put the lid on and I'm gonna move it to a medium simmer. I'm gonna turn the heat down. So this is gonna cook for around an hour. Uh, check it at around 55 minutes. So I made these before, but I've made them with turkey skin. I made turkey cracklins for my sous vide video where I sous vide a turkey breast. Uh, I'm gonna show you how to do this with the skins that you removed from your chicken thighs. And so they're a little smaller, but they're just as flavorful. Um, so what we wanna do is, the first thing we wanna do is we wanna salt and pepper the bottom of this parchment because we're gonna be salting and peppering the things that actually land on this. And so instead of salting and peppering each piece individually, I can just lay them into salt and pepper that's already prepared. And so that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna flatten out as best I can each of these pieces of skin, and I'm gonna lay them down nice and flat into my salt and pepper that is already dispersed nice on my parchment. I wanna to try to not have these folded up as best I can. I wanna to try to make sure that they're as unfolded as possible uh, because the flatter they are, the more even they cook. And you want nice, even, uh, evenly cooked cracklins when you're finished. So now once my bottom piece is mostly full, what I will do is I will go in, I'm gonna wash my hands so I'm not getting a ton of uh, chicken guts into my salt get it all over the pepper. I'm 
what I'm going to do is I'm going to salt and pepper these, and then I'm going to lay another sheet pan on top of them to press them down into shape. Uh, you don't necessarily have to do this um, because they will, uh, they, they would probably stay mostly flat in an oven, but it actually cooks them a little better this way. Uh, it, it winds up uh, heating up both the top and bottom of these pans and it essentially sears them. It's, it's, it sandwiches them and sears them. Now I'm gonna add a little bit of extra virgin olive oil to this. And that is gonna give it a nice richness when it's finally finished. I'm going to squash these down with my hand and sort of press them down so that all the air bubbles are out. And then I'm going to set on top of that a pan. And so now that my skins are on here, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this in a 375 degree oven for about 45 minutes. I'll check it when it's, par when it's about maybe 35 minutes in. I'll check it by using an oven mitt and lifting up and looking inside. You'll be able to see through the parchment whether or not it's actually cooked all the way through, it'll be nice and brown. Uh, and once they're nice and brown and crisp, they're finished. And so we're gonna put them in a 375 degree oven right now. So this has been going for a little over an hour at this point. Uh, and so it's ready to go. Uh, I am actually gonna take it off the heat. And uh, I'm gonna open it up here so you can see what it looks like inside. So the chicken is mostly shredded, ready to go. What I'm gonna do is, I'm actually going to, uh, I'm gonna take the chicken out and put it in a small bowl. You don't necessarily have to do this, you could dump it all in there, but it's a little easier to fish out and try to keep together uh, if I do it now, uh, rather than trying to fish it out of the colander in a second. So I think it's a little easier to get out of this now. And I will say, I don't have butcher's twine, but one great way to make sure that the, that the uh, parsley stems and other stems don't, don't, are easier to fish out is if you use a little bit of butcher's twine and tie them together. Um, then you don't have to worry about really carrying them with you outside of the bowl. They just come right out when you're finished. So that's my chicken, completely ready to go here. Now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strain this. Now all of this vegetable matter in here, this all this vegetable matter is essentially used. That's not like, if you were to squeeze these carrots, you would see that they just literally just smush. We've essentially gotten all the goodness out of this. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna strain this. And what I have is I have a bowl underneath of my colander. And so I'm just gonna take this and pour this directly in and strain out all the bits. And I will have a wonderful stock when it's done. So we'll give it a shake. Get all that water, get all that liquid out of there. And so now I have a wonderful stock for the week. Um, this stock, uh, it's, it's, it's essentially a broth. It's really flavorful, very rich. Um, this is gonna be great if you have to add a flavorful liquid to something. Or if you wanted to, you could, you know, cook up, take some of this chicken, uh, simmer it in some of this broth, throw a little noodle in there. You would have an amazing chicken noodle soup you could even make out of this uh, if you wanted to. But I'm going to reserve this broth, and I'm going to show you what you need to do to get this chicken off the bone. So what we have is we have four chicken thighs, and now you can cook this with eight, you know, 10 chicken thighs to make even more of this if you want. Uh, but what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna show you how to get the chicken off the bone here. Now, it's helpful if you let this cool uh, for a little while on your cutting board. But one, uh, one tool that you can use is a couple of forks to actually just hold down and then pull the chicken directly off. So as you see, I'm just pulling this chicken directly off and this chicken is essentially shreddable chicken. It just falls apart. It's been cooked with these vegetables for a very long time. So it's a really flavorful chicken. Uh, and you could put this like shred this up and put it directly on a salad. What you want to do is try to go through and pull it off the bone. Now there's a couple of little pieces of gristle in here that you got to be careful about. 
chicken thighs have a little tiny piece of gristle in them that normally comes off. It's right on the tip of the bone. So right on the tips of these bones, there's this, and I, uh, you can actually feel it right here, this little piece of gristle that will come off and be really kind of gross. You can see I'm going to pull it directly off the chicken. This, this piece of gristle right here, when it comes off, if you bite into that, it's unpleasant. So my suggestion is get rid of that, find it on the piece and just get rid of it. It normally stays on the bone pretty well, um, but, uh, but you wanna make sure that you don't pull it off in your shredded chicken. Uh, you wanna try to shred your chicken and make sure that the chicken that's shredded is all meat and not like pieces of gristle. And you can of course get as uh, meticulous as you want, pulling off as much chicken as possible. And like I said, this is great chicken for a salad, um, and you can do lots of great stuff with this. So, so I, you know, once this is done, take this, put this in a bag, and then just you'll have this for the week with your reserve stock, and uh, and you'll have a couple of really great ingredients that you can make some really quick food with. All right, so our braised chicken's done, our cracklins are done. Now what we're going to do is we're going to pour our our broth. It's still warm, and so what we're going to do is we're going to leave it sit. Now, tomorrow, when I go into the fridge, there will probably be a tiny thin of film of fat on the top that I can just take right off. I could just use a, a spoon and just scrape it off. There's also a possibility that this may be congealed tomorrow, and so that means it'll feel like jello if I shake it. It'll look like it's actually solid rather than a liquid. That's a good thing. That means that I got a lot of that collagen out of the bones and it made a really wonderful mouthfeel broth. That's good. Don't think it's bad if it's solid. That's not a that's not a bad trait. That's a good trait. You want it to be solid if possible. So that's what you're going to do tomorrow with your stock. You have wonderful cracklins to snack on today and then you also have this this uh this shredded chicken that you can then put into a bag and then use throughout the week. Like I say it's great on salads. Wonderful in a quesadilla. This can be shredded more. I just really just took it off the bone, but you could shred this down into very, very fine shreds if you want. Um, you know, and then there's lots of different applications for shredded chicken and you don't have to go buy chicken in the package um, that they sell you at the store that tastes like somebody basically just cut up a bunch of chalk and put it in a bag. This is gonna be way more flavorful and taste a lot better for you. So congratulations, you just made your first recipe I'm sure you're very proud of yourself. I know I'm very proud of you. Uh, keep coming back and keep learning with me. And if you have any questions that you want to ask, you can put them in the comments for this video. And, and if you want me to cover something, I can maybe create a video about it, especially in this 101 series. If you feel like you don't want to ask your question in front of a bunch of other people, there's no stupid questions, but you may feel a little self-conscious, that's okay. Send me a message at info at seasonlib.com and I will uh, take your, uh, your suggestion under advisement. And if I feel like there's a need for a video, I'll certainly create a video, or at least I'll make a comment about it in a future video. So I wanna thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this and you know somebody else who wants to learn how to cook and doesn't really know where to start, you can share this video with them. Please like it below and, uh, and be sure to subscribe. Click on that little bell down there. That'll make sure that you get, uh, you get uh, notifications when I post a new video. Thanks so much for watching. I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you.